Okay, we have Dave, I see that. Okay, welcome Dave. Okay. Okay. No problem. So I've just yeah, I've just introduced you as our guest expert stellar speaker that's gonna take us through with our panel to come afterwards. Um, I'm just gonna put the screen down and hand over to you and then you can get us on our way. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, just wanna say thanks for having me talk. There's quite a new concept for all of us. Um, and like Lauren was saying last week, just I think it's it's a it's a learning experience for for all of us at the moment with regards to this uh, pandemic at the moment. So um, I'm gonna try and and give you guys a nice eye overview of, of our experiences here at Curtis here, but this is no means a sort of a definitive know it all kind of lecture on on COVID. Um, so I'm just going to basically go through some of the mechanical ventilation um, and try and go through some of the nuances that I've experienced with my colleagues here at Curtis here. And the experience may be different to what some of the other guys are having throughout the rest of the country. So it'll be quite interesting to see exactly what everybody's thoughts are. I think one of the trickiest bits when it comes to managing these COVID patients is when do I escalate to invasive ventilation? And we had a very nice talk last week about how to go about safely intubating these patients. But I think one of the difficulties when it comes to the PUI with the suspected COVID patient is when exactly do I go ahead and intubate and put them on mechanically ventilated patients? So I by no means have the answer to that. I think it's one of the things that I think we all struggle with at the moment. Um, but here's just something simple that I think we can try and utilize. So I've utilized the mnemonic GAS, which essentially stands for gas exchange abnormality, airway protection and secretion. So to look at the patient with all three in tandem, where your gas exchange essentially is looking at the patient's oxygenation and Knowing what we know now with what's going on with COVID is that we previously would put the patients on mechanical ventilation quite early on when SATs were less than 90. But some of the experiences coming through now from New York is that we're probably tolerating much lower um, saturations now, especially with the, the advent of patients being on, on high flow nasal cannula and being able to self trim also, is there a problem with the ventilation? Do they have hypercapnia? And often this is not a problem early on in the disease process, but often happens um, after being ventilated, secondary to a lot of the dead space and, and other pathogenesis of this disease. The work of breathing is a difficult one because these patients often don't have that typical work of breathing early on and the sort of so-called silent hypoxic and this is often a difficult thing when it comes to looking at the indication for intubation. Altered GCS and neurological dysfunction. Um, you don't want to pop an, air, an airway in. And then with what we're finding is that these patients often have quite a large amount of secretions, which is often difficult to clear. So I think in combination when looking at each individual patient, is taking all three of these parameters, looking at the gas exchange, the airway, and secretions when making a decision on whether to escalate to invest invasive ventilation. The one important thing that I always say whenever I talk about ventilation is that we've got to remember that ventilation is a supportive therapy. It doesn't, it doesn't actually cure the patient. It is there to buy us time either for the disease process to burn out or for our therapies to work while we're buying time on the mechanical ventilation. Okay, so mechanical ventilator support is the delivery of 
flow and pressure, which then affects a change in volume. Now, you need the interaction of all three to deliver an adequate uh, mechanical ventilatory support. So this is just a simple diagram looking at the physics of the airway pressure. So if you look at the little blue bit, which signifies the conducting airways, and sort of the, the pink balloon bit as just a simplified diagram of the airway, where your airway pressure in your airway is related to your flow times your resistance. And what's happening at an alveolar level is related to your volume over your compliance plus your peak. And that's quite important when we think about, when we go forward, looking at things like your peak pressures and alveolar pressures. So just to, again, reiterate, the airway pressure is a combination of the pressure in your conducting airways, okay, which is a relation of flow times resistance, and your alveolar pressure is a relation of your volume, your compliance, as well as your peak. Now, what are the goals of mechanical ventilation? So we want to ensure adequate alveolar ventilation, which eliminates CO2, delivery of oxygen. We want to reduce the work of breathing by putting patients on mechanical ventilation and having the mechanical ventilator do most of the work. And we want patients to be comfortable and avoid dysynchrony. And one of the most important things when we talk about our goals of mechanical ventilation for us specifically is to remember the concept of do no harm. And we can do a lot of harm when it comes to lung injury when putting a patient on ventilation. So you can cause volume trauma by increased tidal volumes, battery trauma by high pressures, your bio trauma by your shear forces causing cytokine release at your alveolar level, and atelic trauma by opening, recruiting, de-recruiting alveoli, as well as, well as a shearing injury, which is caused by collapsed alveoli, which is moving against the alveoli that are um, distended, as well as oxygen toxicity, when, especially when we're dealing with high FI2s in the region of above 50%. So in keeping that in mind with regards to our goals, how do we limit the amount of harm that we do? So with regards to alveolar ventilation, we practice the concept of permissive hypercapnia as long as we maintain the pH above 7.15. When it comes to the goals of delivering oxygen, we also have this practice now of this permissive hypoxemia, where we target sats of between 85 to 90, or PO2 of 8. So speaking to many of the colleagues around South Africa, different units, and, and, and even here in our unit, is that it's very challenging to ventilate these patients. And why is that? These patients often have a high mortality rate. So the literature reports up to 80% of patients who've been put on mechanical ventilations dying. At the moment, there's a lot of anecdote and theory. And you listen to a podcast today, you listen to another one tomorrow, there's another theory that comes up about the pathogenesis and the pathophysiology about this disease. Again, we don't quite know enough about this disease and we don't quite clearly understand the pathophysiology. These patients often have an unpredictable course where we find in, in our limited experience is that sometimes the patients may look really well one day and then just have a sudden cardiac arrest and inexplainably dying on the mechanical ventilator. These patients have a profound respiratory drive which often makes it difficult for us to ventilate and sedate these patients. And these patients often have a prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation, up to 14 to 20 days, and it's a slow process. And for many of us here, our resources and capacity limits us to what we're able to do. And the one major think, challenge with regards to COVID at the moment is that there's no specific therapies with proven effectiveness that are currently available. So this is just a study that was recently um, released in JAMA, which looked at 5,700 patients in the New York area. And the, the bottom section of the slide just looks at 
the mortality rate of patients who didn't receive mechanical ventilation, which was 11%, compared to those who received mechanical ventilation of up to 80%. Now, with looking at some of the other literature coming through from China, Italy, these numbers are reflected from other ICUs as well and other hospitals. And again, just looking at the age distribution of these patients, it seems to be tending towards the higher sort of your age bracket. So you still have your death toll between, as you get between your 30 to 40 decades, but as you go higher up in your decades, you'll notice that the mortality increases quite significantly. And that's also been our experience um, with mechanically ventilating these patients with COVID. The number one thing I think we need to realize when managing these patients is our own safety. So use of PPE, which is quite a controversial topic in terms of asking what type of PPE should be used. But I think for us in the ICU, as well as in the emergency unit, where there's an increased risk of aerosolized virus um, with either high risk interventions like intubation or ventilation, um, we should be using our airborne PPE precautions for all of these patients. And what we found here is that what's often quite helpful is the use of the so-called PPE buddy, which is basically just another person which helps you kind of remind you on, on what you forgot, what you need to do. And, and in the heat of the moment, you need that other person just to remind you about your safe practice when it comes to protecting yourself. Also, what goes hand in hand when talking about ventilating these patients is your analgesia and your sedation regime. We found this to be extremely difficult in a lot of the patients we've mechanically ventilated. We start with an analgesia first approach. We usually use a morphine dose and some of our patients have been on quite high morphine infusions, up to 10 to 15 milligrams per, per hour. Remember to add sedation as well, and we want to titrate this to a RAS score of minus one. And importantly, when you're using neuromuscular blockades, so for our patients currently, we put them all on cis aticurium infusions. And important, when you do have patients on your neuromuscular blockade, these patients all need to be receiving sedation, whether it be propofol or diazepam or any sedation of their choice. Another important question which comes around quite frequently is which mode should we use when ventilating these patients? So just again, to go through some of the basics. So your volume control mode is where you set a tidal volume and a minimum ventilatory rate. Your tidal volume is then adjusted accordingly to your limit, but your pressure then becomes quite variable. So there's some good and some bad aspects with regards to your volume-based modes. It's quite easy to set. You dial in a tidal volume for which your machine delivers. You dial in a respiratory rate, and you can achieve an adequate tidal volume, and it avoids sort of that volume trauma and targeting your moles per kilo of six tidal, tidal volume. You also guaranteed a minute ventilation, um, which in these patients, gives you an adequate alveolar ventilation. What's bad about this mode is that patients often require quite a bit of sedation, and it's often asynchronous when it comes to starting ventilating in this mode. And depending on your inspiratory flow rates, the patient may actually lead the ventilator if your inspiratory flow rate is set too low. And remembering that with a fall in your compliance, this will result in quite a high alveolar pressure. So that's something to watch out for, especially when you've got your ventilator alarms limiting, um, ventilating when you reach a certain um, pressure alarm limit. Your pressure control mode, essentially you set an inspiratory pressure as your limit and a minimum ventilatory rate. Now in this instance, your volume is going to be the variable that changes depending on your inspiratory pressure dial in and the time and over which you deliver that inspiratory pressure to. Again, some of the good things, it's quite easy to set up. You dial in an inspiratory time and an inspiratory pressure high. Now this is ensure that you avoid high inspiratory pressures, 
Unfortunately, with that comes the fact that if any change in lung compliance or resistance would result in a change in tidal volume. So if your lung compliance suddenly worsens or your airway resistance worsens, you may actually not be generating adequate tidal volumes. And inappropriate triggering in this mode can also result in increased minute ventilation. What mode is best? And I would say probably the mode that you and your staff are most comfortable and familiar with is probably the mode to start off with and, and is the best for this potential ventilative process. And I would say also the mode that works best for the individual patient. Now, this is going to be a bit of trial and error where certain patients may prefer being on a volume-based mode and certain patients may prefer being on a pressure-based mode. There's a patient upstairs at the moment that we've tried on a pressure-based mode and just would not ventilate. And as soon as we turned her over to a volume-based mode, seemed to have done much better on the ventilation. So again, it depends on what the individual patient again uh, prefers and again, what you're familiar with. Remembering the concept of do no harm, so we want to limit over distension of our OVO line, as this causes inflammation, organ dysfunction, and basic decreased venous return, which then further causes a vicious cycle of worsening the IRDS. So this is a, probably a concept that may not be familiar to some of you, um, the so-called mechanical power. And this essentially is, a, is an equation that was thought of by Luciano Gattinoni around 2016, 2017. And these include all the components of um, the respiratory components that can cause ventilator-induced lung injury, namely your pressures, your volume, your flow, and your respiratory rate. And there's various concepts of this equation. Now, the, the equation itself is not important, but what it does, it shows you that there's interaction of all these various components which can interact together to contribute to the power and ventilator-induced lung injury. So your respiratory rate, your change in your tidal volume, your delta tidal volume, your elastans, your resistance, as well as your PEEP can all contribute to ventilator-associated lung injury. So what have the surviving sepsis guidelines recommended? So they recommend starting off with a low tidal volume, starting off with four to eight moles of predicted body weight, targeting your plateau pressures of less than 30, this is a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence and using a higher PEEP strategy over low PEEP strategy. This is a slightly weaker recommendation. Again, they've recommended for the use of deep sedation, which may be required to control these high respiratory drives and to also target your volume targets that you've dialed in. How do you calculate a predicted body weight? Now, I'm not going to go into too much depth, but remember the most important thing when looking at all of these equations is that you've got to remember not to utilize your actual body weight when it comes to calculating the tidal volume for these patients. Now, you can either use the formula on top, and remember it's different in men and in women, or you can extrapolate that from using a BMI of 22 and calculating it backwards. For me, when I start off, I use quite a simple number. You take the height of in men in centimeters. So let's say you've got a 175 centimeter uh, male. You subtract that by number of 105, and that essentially gives you quite a close ballpark estimation of your predicted body weight. And that is the weight in which you're going to use to calculate your initial tidal volume setting. So just going back to that initial basic equation, remember that your airway pressure is a combination of your conducting airways, which is essentially your flow times your resistance, added with your alveolar pressure, which is the pink part of the balloon, which contributes to the, to the airway pressure with your conducting airways. So how do we calculate a plateau pressure and what is a plateau pressure? So looking at the scalar waveform, so this is a flow waveform on your right-hand side in the, the bottom uh, waveform, and this is the pressure waveform on the top graphic. You can see as flow increases to a steady state, and this is a volume-based mode, you can see that it reaches a peak inspiratory pressure. 
when we have an inspiratory pause or down in a inspiratory hold where there's no flow, the resistance in the airway becomes negligible and it drops down to a plateau pressure. And essentially the difference between your peak pressure and your plateau pressure is the pressure in your conducting airways. The plateau pressure is then the airway, um, the pressure which is needed to distend and overcome the compliance to distend the alveolus at full inspiration. So just looking at the equation again, so airway pressure is flow times resistance plus your alveolar pressure. If we take away the flow component, we're only left with the alveolar pressure, which essentially is your plateau pressure. So again, just briefly recapping, the alveolar pressure it corresponds to your plateau pressure, and when flow is reduced to zero, as in this graph over here, we can see that the alveolar pressure will equalize with the airway pressure and will correspond to the alveolar pressure at full inspiration. So the inspiratory pause pressure corresponds to the plateau pressure, and in some ventilators, you have an inspiratory pause hold maneuver, which will give you the adequate uh, plateau pressure on certain ventilators. So again, looking at this, we can see that we reach a peak inspiratory pressure in our airway, airway um, pressure scalar waveform. And then as soon as we stop the flow, it drops down. Now this pressure is due to airway resistance and the rest of this pressure due to pulmonary compliance is our plateau pressure. Now the difference between our PEEP, a baseline, and our plateau pressure is known as a driving pressure. And this is quite an important pressure when it comes to the concept of preventing alveolar um, lung injury. So your plateau pressure minus your PEEP essentially is your driving pressure. Now this essentially tells you about your compliance in your, in your system. So Amato uh, and others did a trial in 2015 and looked at the driving pressures and found that driving pressures were a strong predictor of mortality when it comes to looking at patients with ARDS. Subsequent meta-analysis suggested that targeting driving pressures of below 13 to 15 was associated with improved mortality. The problem with COVID-19 is that it's not your typical ARDS. And what we found is that we can't have this one-size-fits-all approach when dealing with many of these patients. So this was a study um, editorial released by Luciano Gattinoni and Chumello, where they looked at patients who had a relatively preserved compliance with the reduced, front, reduced shunt fraction, which was very different to the previous ARDS type of um, compliance, which wasn't preserved and was, and was quite low. They then came out with this editorial, which I'm sure many of you have come across so far, is looking at the different types of phenotypes associated with COVID pneumonia. They looked at 150 ventilated patients with severe COVID pneumonia, where up to 50% of patients retained a near normal lung compliance, despite having severe hypoxemia. And they noted that there was quite a lot of heterogeneity in the presentation, the physiological abnormalities, as well as the response to intervention. And they proposed a time-related disease spectrum with these two primary phenotypes. So they came up with the phenotype suggestion of a type L and a type H COVID pneumonia. Now this is a CT um, on the same patient in that, in that study and editorial that they released. And the top graph is looking at this patient early on in the disease process. And this is later on in the, in the disease process with a similar PF ratio. Now what this CT scan shows on the left initially is that this was taken with the patient spontaneously breathing and it shows this value looking at the number of aerated tissue on that CT scan. The total lung weight in the above CT was just over a kilogram with 7.8%, which was not aerated, and the gas volume was just over four liters. 
At this stage, the patient was just on a venturi mask at 80% oxygen. Later on in the disease, in the same patient, this was a CT done, which showed during mechanical ventilation that now the distribution was shifted markedly to the right with non-aerated components, while the left components of aerated lung were markedly reduced. Now the total lung water, um, lung tissue weight increased by more than double to 2.7 kilos, of which only uh, less than 50% was aerated and the gas volume was now just under 1.4 liters. So over time, they proposed that the ventilator-associated lung injury and unchecked viral disease incite this inflammatory process in edema, which promotes this local and generalized thrombogenesis, increases intense cytokine release, causing right ventricular overload, which then further leads to down the line systemic organ dysfunction. So the different phenotypes, the L and the H, stands for low and high. The low being that of a low elastance or a normal compliance, a low VQ and loss of hypoxic vasoconstriction, and low lung weight. Also, they show to have low lung recuitability as the lungs were mostly aerated. On the high phenotype, they showed that this was more typical of your standard ARDS type picture where the patient had reduced compliance, a high shunt fraction due to the perfusion of the dematous lung regions, high lung weight, and high lung recruitability. So they then suggested different management strategies for the type L phenotype. These patients were shown to respond quite well to the reversal of hypoxemia, especially if the, high, if the oxygen was given early on in the disease process. These patients were also monitored for increased work of breathing, which with their large inspiratory pressures caused an increase in the risk of lung injury. And they suggested that these patients should be intubated sooner rather than later. And that early intubation may stop the progression of type L to type A. However, once intubated and deeply sedated, these patients can be ventilated with slightly higher tidal volumes as proposed from your surviving sepsis guidelines. In this instance, because most of the lung is aerated and there isn't a large shunt fraction, prone positioning may not be helpful in this instance. The lung is quite compliant and therefore a lower PEEP strategy would be more effective. And again, important to avoid your ventilator associated lung injury as these patients have a high respiratory drive and often have quite high respiratory um, tidal volumes and require quite high sedation and neuromuscular blockade. So this brings us to the concept of the p silly phenomenon, which is patient self-inflicted lung injury. And with this increased respiratory drive, it may increase tidal strains and energy loads on a patient's respiratory effort already applied to vulnerable tissue. And these strong spontaneous inspiratory efforts, they increase the tissue stress they raise the pulmonary pressure and cause further fluid leakage, hence the need for deep sedation and neuromuscular blockade, which may in fact disrupt the cycle. Now the management of suggestion, management suggestions for type H are more in keeping with our traditional severe AODS. Here we keep the lower tidal volume, four to six moles of predicted body weight, a higher peak of between 10 to 15 and sometimes higher, and targeting again after toe pressures of less than 30 centimeters. And again, these patients often benefit from prone positioning for up to 16 hours at least. So what do you do when the alarms are going off on the ventilator? The peak airway pressures are more than 35. You need to evaluate whether there's any potential secretion which is blocking the ET tube. Now remember, your peak airway pressure is a, 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 a relation of your flow as well as your airways resistance. Important to make sure that it's not a problem with your plateau pressure and that the problem is not at the level of the alveolus. Check that your ET tube is not 
deep, we go down the right main bronchus and you will evaluate for pneumothorax. Remember, checking with ultrasound, whether you have your seashore sign, um, if it's absent, looking for the barcode, it's more indicative of potential pneumothorax for these patients. High alveolar pressures caused by excessive tidal volume. Remember the relation of tidal volume over compliance and PEEP. Gas trapping, especially with increased respiratory rates, as well as high PEEP and low compliance can all result in high alveolar pressures. So what to do when your plateau pressure is more than 30 centimeters? So the first step would be to reduce your tidal volume by at least one mole per kilo to a minimum of four moles per kilo. In this instance, you may consider diuresis depending on the fluid balance of the patient and whether they are hemodynamically stable. Most of our patients are started on neuromuscular blockade to help in turn reduce the plateau pressure and, and the transpulmonary pressures. Again, if the ventilator rate is quite high, you can reduce the respiratory rate to try and avoid the auto peep or dynamic hyperinflation. What to do if the patient is acidotic? The important thing is to remember to first evaluate whether this is a respiratory or metabolic acidosis. If it is a respiratory acidosis, you may want to increase your respiratory rate initially by just two to six to lower your carbon dioxide. Remember, if you go higher than a respiratory rate of 30, you will need to re reduce your inspiratory time to avoid an inverse inspiratory to expiratory ratio, which potentially can cause uh, dynamic hyperinflation. And you need to monitor for autopeep. Also remember to evaluate and treat any metabolic abnormalities such as your lactate or an iron gap. Now, this is a problem we often see quite frequently when dealing with the mechanically ventilated patient in COVID is the refractory hypoxemia. These patients are often quite refractory to any of our interventions when trying to get their PO2. Important, you have time and consult an expert if needs be. Year patients may benefit from proning and consider the use of recruitment maneuvers. Again, just be cautious in the, in the event when patients are hemodynamically unstable and they recommend to avoid sort of your staircase recruitment maneuver in this instance. Again, 30% of patients with um, COVID may have underlying cardiac dysfunction, such as myocarditis and cardiomyopathy, which may be contributing to a lack of oxygenation delivery to the tissues. Neuromuscular blockade, um, important. We use cis um, followed by an infusion on, on these patients. And again, something which hasn't really been evaluated um, at the moment is ECMO. And the, the studies and evidence for that is, is lacking at the moment, but something to consider early on if you are dealing with refractory hypoxemia. Now, just a little bit of, about proning patients. Now, this was studied quite extensively from um, our, our ARDS data, and there was found to be a mortality benefit, especially in the group of patients with very low PF ratios below 100. The placebo trial in 2013 showed a marked mortality benefit in severe ARDS, showing a reduction in 28-day mortality of 16% in the patients who were prone versus 32.8% in patients who were supine. And they suggested proning at least for 12 hours, up to 16 hours a day. So what are the effects physiologically of proning? So it optimizes your VQ mismatch. It increases blood flow to dependent lung tissue. It increases your your functional residual capacity and reduces atelectasis. Your heart sits against your sternum rather than your left lung in the prone position, and therefore majority of your, your left lung is less compressed. You also have decreased transpleural pressure gradient between the dependent and non-dependent lung in the prone position. And your plateau pressure is more uniformly distributed when the patients are in the prone position. So lastly, I'd just like to touch on a little bit about APRV. It's something that I think the guys in Johannesburg and maybe Khatem and I know George are using um, 
quite extensively in, in, in ventilating these patients. It's not something that we are commonly using in our uh, unit here at, at Critis here. But essentially, it's, an, it's a pressure controlled mode, um, which essentially is an inverse ratio mode, which gives intermittent mandatory ventilation with unrestricted but spontaneous breaths. You set two levels of P, a P high and a P low, and the patient is then able to breathe spontaneously during both your P high and your P low. Now, typically your P high is set much longer than your P low, and this essentially maintains recruitment and generates a high mean airway pressure and sort of causes a degree of water peep. Now, your initial settings, you would set your P plat, your P high, to a maximum of 30, and your P low from zero to five centimeters of water. Your T high would be at about five seconds, and your P low at 0.5 to 0.8 seconds. Now, there are some risks when it comes to ventilating patients in air breathing. You can cause quite significant volley trauma and increase transpulmonary pressures. Patients can have increased work of breathing due to the spontaneous breathing. There's also quite a significant risk for hyperinflation. There's a marked increase on right ventricular afterload, which may worsen pulmonary hypertension. And this, especially in patients who are hypervolemic, may cause quite a severe reduction in venous return and cardiac output. Lastly, there are some things which contribute and help and aid us when ventilating these patients um, with COVID. Some of the things that we found are quite useful is to avoid a positive fluid balance or hypovolemia in these patients and to maintain a sort of neutral fluid balance. Please be cautious not to avoid drying these patients up too much and, and causing um, acute renal impairment. Deep sedation is often required in these patients and we've needed quite high uh, levels of morphine uh, as well as propofol in these patients. Something which has now recently become up is a thromboprophylaxis. All of our patients currently in our COVID ICU are currently on full anticoagulation. And it's now postulated that these patients may be at a higher risk of venothromboembolism. Um, and microthrombosis, which may be contributing to the, the pathophysiology of this disease. Remember your ulcer prophylaxis, your glucose control, and then treating any specific complications that may arise. And then importantly, I think one thing to just remember is to keep your families of the patients frequently updated, either telephonically or over video calls. So the one thing I would say to take home and the most important thing with regards to mechanical ventilation in COVID is to tailor your therapy to the individual patient. Now we've had several patients on mechanical ventilation and each and every single one of them has been different. They require different strategies and different implementation when it comes to their ventilation. So the take home. So remember in this illness, your safety is paramount. Wear the appropriate PPE. So when intubating and ventilating these patients, there's a high risk of aerosolization. So wear your appropriate PPE airborne precautions and remember the utility and the use of a PPE buddy. Mechanical ventilation in COVID carries a high mortality. And remember that despite this, part of what we need to do when putting these patients on mechanical ventilation is to do no harm. Stick to what you are comfortable with and what your staff are familiar with. Trying out new combined complicated ventilation strategies is not the time to be learning on these type of patients. It's not a one size fits all approach. Remember, do no harm. Avoid your ventilator induced lung injury. You need to assess and reassess and go back and change and fiddle as appropriate. Consult an expert early in the field when you are struggling. And remember, um, be safe out there. Thank you. These are some of my references. And I'm sure Cumlin will make um, the talk and references available to uh, some of you guys. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Um, it's quite a pity that we haven't had this presentation live because I'm sure you'd see the entire class stand up and give you a standing ovation right now. 
Um, that was an excellent topic, uh, an excellent presentation on a very difficult and evolving topic, and um, definitely one that we're going to keep for reference for future use and probably review this before any critical care shift, to be honest. Um, without delaying any further, I just want to ask if the panel um, wouldn't mind putting their cameras on and keep it on for the duration of the discussion. So, Conrad, hey, there we go. Um, and then maybe one of uh, either video or, or prof from the from the Emprit side, um, and then Lauren, if you wouldn't mind uh, jumping in as well, and then we can start the discussion. So I'm actually going to ask Conrad on of, on his opinions and his experiences um, in the UK, being privileged enough to kind of have the um, oh, context of South Africa as well as where he's right now, and uh, if he's had anything to add or anything different that's going on there. And then um, I'll let the discussion continue. Um, after this, when we proceed, we'll just ask Lauren if she wouldn't mind to come in and, and, and start the Q&A session. OK, so Conrad, if you wouldn't mind. Would you mind? Yeah, there we go. Your mic. Unmuted. Ah. Can you hear me now? But I can't hear you. Is that the? Uh... I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, that's fine. OK. Uh, hi, Dave. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice uh, thing. No, thank you for the presentation. It seems like we're all struggling with the same, with the same, same, but different, different. Uh, these patients do catch you out sometimes, and there's definitely no one size fits all. At the moment, our approach is almost putting them to four categories, not just the L and the H, but if it's pure COVID, which you'll find these L and H ventilator strategies and the difference between them, and then which component is bacterial mostly, because some of these people have been sitting. Uh, at home, especially the UK is quite good at self-isolating and they'll, they've they got good pre-hospital and quick assessment. So if they phone, the ambulance is there within 15 to 20 minutes, if it's if that long. And then how much a component of them had bacterial infection, we've had some of them, uh, which looks like on the x-ray there's extra, um, not just the virus and the classic COVID that we're using the word now. And then there's, because of the microthrombi and the um, VTE, like I see you guys have got full prophylactic or full treatment dose, low molecular weight heparin. We actually have got an adjusted one where we go double dose of the prophylaxis. But these guys, um, we get the COVID swab positive, but then you throw them through a CTPA and you didn't have any thought about it. And they've got these massive PEs or submassive because their blood pressure can still make it. And we've actually thrombolized people and they get discharged um, with swab positive, but it might be that the biggest component to their pathology was the PEs. So we actually class them into four um, categories at the moment. The ventilator strategies all stick to the same principles of just try to keep them safe while their lungs try to heal and trying to stick your pressure safe. We've got some extra toys to play with. We've got nitric oxide if you really struggle with the oxygenation. and um, it's universally used here, yeah, the bi-level, which is basically APRV with a longer, and you can adjust your IE ratio. And like you said, if you use what you used to, if you switch from bi-level to any other mode of ventilation, yeah, you almost have to do a tutorial first. The nurses aren't trained in SIMV of any sort. Uh, as soon as you switch a volume or pressure SIMV or different mode, then you almost have to spend a tutorial on it and they all get very angsty. So again, if you do use one mode, use that mode very well and know it all, all of its ins and outs rather than play with new modes now, especially if you're going to be ventilating this patient in ED. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Conrad. That's excellent. I think that that really opens up the discussion for us. Thanks so much for that presentation, Dave. That was really excellent. Um, I think, you know, just for myself at least, when it comes to ventilation and getting your head around um, the concepts of it, ventilation is very much um, something that you, you become familiar through practice as well. And so um, as, as helpful as, the, as going through all the conceptual uh, intricacies of the ventilation, I actually think that um, it would even have been more helpful or in future sessions to, to create some kind of opportunity for us to demonstrate it on the ventilator itself. And so, uh, at least in my mind, I think uh, as a spin-off from this session, I think we might try and create a simulation or demonstration-based session where we can put the concepts that you've raised into um, actual uh, practice and demonstration, which, uh, yeah, will... We'll, um, reinforce what you've discussed this afternoon. 
Um, yeah, I think, Conrad, even though you work in a different perspective, as you say, um, or in a different setting with a different kind of perspective, uh, a lot of the approaches and the principles remain the same. And so I think, you know, you find yourself in a different stage of the uh, of the disease and, and the way that it's affected the community. And uh, you might have a better understanding of how it's uh, affecting your ICUs and your ECs, but we are still to approach that. So we have a lot to learn from you in terms of, you know, what's on the horizon for us. Um, I know that video is on, uh, on the Teams platform. Um, Vidya, are you able to provide us with any comments or perspectives from your side as to what's happening in Pretoria? Okay, if I can <clears throat> maybe mention one of the things that I think might be of value is that when we're talking about ventilation of these ARDS patients, people must just remember, and I know, you know, we said a lot of, of the pathophysiology and it's not a typical ARDS picture, but when we go to the H type, we're getting sort of in that ballpark. But when we when we think about that, the ventilation of those kind of patients, people must just remember that it's a it's a bit of a aggressive ventilation strategy that we use. We're using, for example, PEEP. And um, people sometimes forget that when you use PEEP, there are certain uh, effects, uh, cardiovascular effects, as well as um, pulmonary effects. Uh, it's a patient that you should that should be in a setting where you can, for example, support the cardiovascular system with, your, with inner drugs. Um, because the higher you go up with PEEP, you might find that your patient's blood pressure starts falling. So I think, um, you know, it's just the kind of patient that probably is going to benefit from a central line. Uh, it's probably the kind of patient that's going to benefit from an arterial line. So it's your typical, really your typical ICU kind of situation. It's not like your run-of-the-mill ordinary ventilation of a patient with healthy lungs. And it needs that kind of backup and support when you deal with it. Um, I, I also think that for us in the emergency department, we need to really just understand uh, the bread and butter kind of um, elements of, of ventilation to, 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 to be able to do it well. I also, also believe that you should become familiar with a basic set of a basic strategy for an asthma patient, a basic strategy for a normal lung, and a basic strategy for a patient with a uh, ARDS type of picture so that you can, if you've got those those six, more or less six settings that you usually put on a ventilator, and you know how to adjust those settings uh, for your diff, different type of ventilation strategies, then, then you, you're in a good and strong position. So it's not rocket science, not that many things that you need to know. You, you need to know some basic stuff. And then the last comment I'll make is that I agree with you. I think one of the best ways to, to, to teach ventilation is to take a ventilator and a test lung. And you can literally see what you do uh, with the patient's lung by putting it on the test lung. You can look at your PEEP. You can play with the PEEP. Put the PEEP to 30 on the test lung and see how that how it looks at the ends of expiration. Uh, put the PEEP at zero and see how it completely collapses, you know. So playing with a test lung is one of the best ways that you can actually learn the ventilator and see what all these effects, you know, putting it on volume control and do a little squeeze of the bag and see how it responds and how it responds when it gets a full ventilator breath and how it responds when you get a pressure support breath. And it really gives you a more practical uh, feel for, 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 for how the ventilator works. Well, that's, that's from my side. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, as always, very wise words. Um, and I think, you know, until such time as we are from a teaching platform able to create the demonstration uh, of the ventilator setup, I would urge all of you who are in your own ECs to sit with the ventilator um, for 5, 10, 15 minutes and try and test out these things that Dave has, has spoken about, you know, even if it just is to the point of identifying how to change your modes, how to tweak your vent, what it is that we're talking about, it really starts to solidify these concepts in your mind. Okay, um, I'm gonna have, I have one comment and then I'm gonna throw it to 
the audience who are starting to populate the chat with questions. And so I think um, it is definitely important that we bear in mind that the ventilation of the COVID infected patients is um, it bears emphasizing that it's a supportive therapeutic modality. You know, we're trying to still understand the pathophysiology of COVID and how it affects um, the individual patients. But I think we're learning more and more through uh, other people's experiences that the ventilatory strategies uh, are, can definitely be harmful to the patient. And we have to employ um, a strategy that is, is supportive and non-harmful to the patients. And so as part of that discussion, I think we're trying to find a way to cluster characteristics of COVID into a respiratory type syndrome. You know, as you say, Prof, you want to have the approach to the asthmatic or the obstructive uh, picture and the restrictive picture or the ARDS picture. And there's been a lot of discussion thrown around as to whether COVID is uh, comparable to ARDS. Is it more comparable to high altitude pulmonary edema. And I think um, Marini and, and Catanoni have now said in JAMA at least uh, that they feel that it warrants uh, sort of uh, labeling these patients as COVID ARDS. Um, how do you feel, Dave, maybe um, about that new classification from a respiratory and ventilatory point of view? Yes, I think, I think it's useful to classify these patients differently from your typical ARDS, but again, to create one single um, umbrella to just put them all under, I, I'm not sure we can. Um, every single one of our patients that we've had with COVID has been different. Um, one patient's got abnormal liver functions with transaminitis of over 10,000 and the next one's got renal impairment. One blood pressure is through the roof. The next one's needing inotropes. Um, the one's on a PEEP of 20, other ones are on a PEEP of 10. So again, I think, yes, it might be useful to think about it as a completely different disease process. But again, within the disease, the patients behave completely differently from one to the next. So I'm not sure how useful it is just to lump them all under one heading. And I think that the take home should be that we've got to tailor our, our, our strategy, whether, whether it be um, treating a secondary bacterial pneumonia, a PE, and we've got to tailor it to the individual patient in front of us. And I think that should be the, 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 the real take home. Okay, excellent. 100% thank you. So um, the, the meeting, I mean, sorry, the, the chat section is going wild, so I'm going to have to open this up to um, the audience. If I could just re-emphasize that um, we're trying to create a, a more organic kind of discussion. So I'm going to throw the questions to people who have been on the meeting chat. If you could just listen out for your question. And then uh, when I throw the floor to you, if you could turn your mic and your camera on and ask your question. Uh, so I'm going to start with Luke Bush. Uh, I see you have a question. Do you want to do you want to raise your question with the panel now? Hi David Conrad. Um, so I just wanted to say that it's quite clear that the ventilation of these COVID patients is having poor outcome. And then there are a cohort of patients who do, do well with high flow nasal or non-invasive and awake proning. Um, Conrad, for you, I just want to, what was your experience with this in the UK and do you support this strategy? And then Dave, I'm, I'm concerned that this is our missing middle of our oxygenation strategy here in South Africa and that it might have quite significant consequences for us and our patients. Just your thoughts about that. So maybe Conrad first and then Dave. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, can, if you can hear me, our strategy is definitely to try to um, postpone ventilation, mechanical ventilation in terms of intubation. Uh, like last week's talk, if once you get there, you're in a rough space. And these patients um, have got a unique capability of, because the lungs initially, or at a stage, and we don't know which stage it is, aren't that stiff, and the work of breathing, which you usually do, and we use accessory muscles to overcome that, they can actually sit around breathing at 30 to 35 for longer uh, without getting too tired, probably from uh, a 
respiratory drive central or respiratory without having to work as hard. They go quicker and they've got good minute ventilation, but they don't work as hard. So we've got enough um, stock to put almost all our patients first on high flow nasal cannula uh, with high flows, uh, the Fresenius Carby Evo, I think it's actually from Fisher Pakel. And then maybe even a trial of putting them on the stomachs, giving uh, non-invasive um, pressure support via face mask interface. And then if they fail that, then we try to bring them to ICU and then we start using our um, strategies. And again, like you said, the strategies would be focused on is just keeping safe plateau pressure, safe driving pressures, titrate your PEEP. And the same basics are just in different, every patient just has, shows different response to the basics. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, Luke, just repeat the question you wanted me to address, please. Sure. So I was just concerned that this is a missing middle. We do not have in our oxygenation strategy in South Africa at this point in time, just from a resources point of view. And it's going to have quite significant, my concern is it's going to have significant implications for us and our patients. Um, we're going to have people on low flow strategies, so your nasal cannula and your non rebreather, and we've got some ventilators, but it's the middle people who are going to need more ventilatory support from an oxygenation point of view, which we aren't going to be able to provide. And I'm concerned, and I just wanted your thoughts about that. Yes, I think that's, that's quite a valid uh, concern, Luke. I think we've got to just remember that a lot of the evidence and 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 is anecdote at the moment. It's not really trial showing that these patients on high flow are doing better. Um, and just looking at our kind of experience here at, at Krutuskir is that we actually haven't needed to escalate to the mechanical ventilation strategy in, in many patients. Um, and a lot of the patients are actually doing quite well just on the rebreather or, or uh, venturi face mask. So I don't know how much more benefit a high flow strategy gives you. I think it probably does. But again, it's going to be that specific individual. And again, it's going to be tailored. And I think in South Africa, yes, we probably don't have access to it. And I think that's probably going to be the rate limiting step. But I agree with you. I, I think it's a useful strategy. I think we haven't employed it because of the, the potential risk of aerosolization. And I think we can get around that by potentially putting a mask, a surgical mask on the patient uh, over the, the high flow. But again, I mean, looking just at, at us here in, in our ICU, we, we only have about four of the high flow nasal oxygen. And we currently utilizing our, our negative pressure rooms um, for our ventilated COVID. So again, you could you could think about a strategy um, in cohorting these patients at, to minimize the risk, but remember that it does come with a risk, albeit a small one. It does come with the risk to stop. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I see. Um, yeah, Vidya and Prof, would you like to? Would you like to chime in? I see there's a lot of discussion happening there. I don't want to pry. <laughs> I think you're having discussions and I'm nosy. <laughs> oh, no, you caught us. <laughs> um, well, no, what we were just saying uh, to each other was we also don't have um, that many high flow nasal cannula um, or negative pressure rooms to put the patients on them in. Um, so we're also sort of missing that middle step that Khrutaskir uh, is as well. Uh, I'm trying to add. Yeah, I think uh, it's going to be like a situation of uh, using a bit until we hopefully get more of these devices coming in because there's a lot of talk around here about, you know, people that's going to supply us with more of these devices. But um, in the interim, we are sort of making all sorts of MacGyver plans, you know, putting on um, non breather masks with nasal cannula and putting a surgical mask over it and, and, and that kind of stuff, you know. So we're making a plan for that missing middle um, to sort of sort of uh, get something that, that gives us as, as good as possible a, a FiO2 on, onto these patients. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's tricky, you know, as, as you say, Dave, 
from what we know, um, we know that there's a wrong way to do things. And so I think we're learning quite quickly what's not working, but we don't really know what the right way to do things is. And as you say, every center is different. So we have to find what works best for us. And it's a discussion that we're going to have to have. And this is the benefit of having this kind of panel discussion and sharing opinions and discussions and reading widely and um, monitoring the evolving evidence. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll, yeah, we'll have to see. There's definitely a gap and it's something that we need to actively engage in. And um, for the registrars, just so you know, we are looking at those kinds of things. So we are looking at the non-invasive um, oxygenation and ventilatory strategies. So don't feel like um, this is something that is going unnoticed. We are noticing it and we are addressing it. And when we have some kind of consensus and we know how to safely recommend these kinds of strategies, because that's the other thing is that we have to put the provider's safety first and foremost as well. Okay, Luke, I see that you um, posted on behalf of Dr. Naidu from Pretoria. Um, is that because Dr. Naidu is unable to contribute to the chat or, uh, yeah, I think Dr. No, Naidu. Uh, it's just via the, the, the email. So they, the chat is only accessible to people who have an institutional login. I've had a few emails and there's a couple more coming through now. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, I would imagine that Dr. Naidu is on Teams with us. If you wouldn't mind turning on your camera and your mic and asking your question to the panel now, please. Hi. Hi, thank you. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I have a question regarding auto peak In patients that have severe um, asthma or COPD that present as COVID positives, how do we ma manage those patients that are on ventilators? Traditionally, we would do an asthma hug on them and disconnect them from the ventilator, but I'm not sure with aerosolization of the, the virus, how that's managed. I'm, I'm not sure I got most of the question. Um, was it with regards to deterioration of an asthmatic patient on a ventilator? Yeah, yeah maybe. So uh, Dave, if I think I understand the question right, it's about a patient with uh, air stacking in COPD or asthma that uh, where we can't really disconnect the ventilator now to sort of let them allow them to have a proper exhalation. Uh, is there other options to get that addressed? Yeah, so definitely the first option in, in somebody who is asthmatic with a auto peep dynamic type inflation, um, you wouldn't want to disconnect in this instance for the risk of aerosolization. So I would make sure, one, the patient is adequately sedated and then come down on your respiratory rate quite dramatically. So if you've been on a respirate of, of 10, you come down all the way to a respirate of 6 to make sure that you have adequate um, expiration uh, phase of, of, uh, of this, the cycle, of your respiratory cycle. But I wouldn't disconnect. Dave, you've muted yourself. I've muted. I've muted. Did you hear that last bit? The most important bit is to reduce the respirate to go quite low and practice permissive hyper, um, hypercapnia. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, the next question, we're coming in thick and fast, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker. Um, also from... Uh, Califong Hospital from Dr. You will have to uh, excuse my pronunciation. I'm sure it's incorrect. From Novika Harry Buns. Uh, could you turn on your camera and ask your question for Dr. Fredericks, please? Hi, Dr. Fredericks. Um, I've got a question regarding the recruitment maneuvers for patients with COVID on ventilators. So you said we should avoid the step, the staircase um, recruitment maneuvers. Can you elaborate on what would be the safest and most appropriate 
recruitment maneuvers for these patients then. So the, the first proviso would say is to, before you're doing any recruitment maneuver, is to make sure that the patient has a low compliance. One, that you're dealing with a strategy where the patient may benefit from recruitment. Um, and secondly, that the patient is hemodynamically stable before attempting any recruitment maneuver, um, as the patient can um, basically arrest if, if, if they're not hemodynamically stable with recruitment. So the, the strategy that we'd use, we normally typically in, in, in your everyday situation with regards to recruitment, we use our staircase maneuver, but it's not recommended in your COVID patients. So what we would tend to use in a pressure-based mode is to increase the inspiratory pressure to quite high to about 25 to 30 and increase the inspiratory time and lengthen that to about two seconds um, and increasing the PEEP to about 15 and just to basically slowly ventilate at a higher peak inspiratory pressure for a period of about one to two minutes and obviously watching the hemodynamics and oxygenation at that point. When you have done this recruitment maneuver, it's important to remember now that you've opened up your atelectatic uh, portion of your lung, is to then not go down um, with your PEEP that you had initially prior to recruitment. You need to then go to a slightly higher PEEP to maintain that alveoli open. So I would use a, again, to answer your question, a pressure-based mode with a prolonged inspiratory phase, um, prolonged inspiratory time with a high pressure for a period of about a minute or two, just to try and recruit that um, a lot slower than you would do in your stepwise up in your peak 20, 25, 30 um, in that scenario. Great, thanks Dave. Uh, the next question comes from Camlin. Camlin, do you want to answer your question? Uh, sorry, do you want to ask your question rather? Hi, yes, so my question is for Dave and um, for actually for, for ICU um, in general. So I just want to know, uh, taking it from the strategy of now, we've just intubated this patient and we've done last week that we go through sort of a, um, a standard reasonable cocktail is kind of ketamine and rocuronium. So now we've intubated the patient, we've got them paralyzed for let's say the next 25 minutes or so. What strategy do we need to then employ in the EC before this patient gets to ICU? Would you like us to then keep them on a complete neuromuscular blockade? And what initial vent settings can we use that will provide sort of give the, the patient the best chance to go to ICU? And how do you want us to package that patient to send them through to you? So I think importantly um, to to try and while the patient is under paralysis to try and get up some of your your central lines, A lines, etc. Um, these patients often move quite quickly um, at the moment from being intubated to the ICU. Um, I, I would say the one thing just to remember is that rocuronium is quite a long acting uh, muscle relaxant. So to make sure you've got adequate sedation and analgesia on board. So I would I would opt from an easy point of view, to up with a bolus of morphine, so up to five to 10 milligrams bolus and start on an infusion of morphine. I wouldn't start a neuromuscular um, blockade strategy in the EC. Um, make sure that the patient, one, is hemodynamically stable um, on an adequate analgesia and sedation. So we use propofol in, um, in the ICU for these patients. Again, it's going to be how familiar you and your nursing staff are going to be with commencing propofol. It's quite a, it's quite a nice drug because it's easily titratable. Um, and often these patients, in, in our experience, they, they, we're struggling with their blood pressures being quite high initially. So it's actually quite a nice, nice um, sort of agent with regards to the, the, the high blood pressure that we're experiencing. From an initial ventilator uh, settings, I would start off sort of with your low tidal volume strategy. I would definitely start them on a volume-based mode. I think that's what most people are familiar with. Um, I think it's the safest mode in terms of setting up your, or looking at your PEEP and your, your plateau. 
and looking at your plateau pressures, you can then titrate your tidal volumes according to your gases. Um, I would start with probably with a peep of between 8 and 10 and titrate accordingly um, based on, on the gases from that aspect. Um, high if I choose to start off with initially, as these patients often require if I choose of 90 uh, to 100, um, with a peep of between 8 to 10, depending again on which phenotype you, 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 you're starting with. Often these patients are quite compliant, um, so you may end up with quite high tidal volumes, which might be quite lung injurious, so just to be cautious with, with these patients. Hopefully at this stage your rocuronium is still effective, um, so you're able to control a lot of a lot of that work of breathing and, and spontaneous respiratory effort where that's concerned. Um, from a respiratory rate point of view, again, I would probably titrate that between 18 and 20, depending on the CO2. But again, remembering that the combination of your respiratory rate and your tidal volume can also induce uh, your ventilator um, lung injury. So from, from the easy point of view, I would say important, try and get as many of your potential lines up, um, gases, and then start off with that, that initial settings and uh, hopefully uh, get the patient to ICU. Um, the thing you want to try and, and avoid is obviously very high airway pressures, blowing pneumones, um, barotrauma, et cetera. Sure, thanks Dave, thank you. Yeah, excellent, thanks Dave. Um, yeah, I think in, in the EC, you know, the ventilatory strategy in the EC is, as opposed to the ICU is maybe a little bit different, at least from my perspective, in that the inclination sometimes on the initial vent setup in an intubated patient in the EC is try to rush to demonstrate return to normal physiological parameters. And I think that that's not really feasible for us in the EC and, and definitely has been shown to be injurious in some ways. And so it's just not a safe strategy. And so I think we just need to be a little bit more cautious and we need to be a bit more patient and we need to take each um, case on its merits and try and achieve what is safe for that patient in the time that we have with the patient in the EC. Would you agree? Um, Dave, and then Prof and Lydia. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. And I think um, what what we often in the emergency, in terms of our, our um, strategy, we often like seeing dramatic results quite quickly. And I think with this illness, we're going to have to accept sort of lower targets when it comes to oxygenation um, and maybe accepting saturations initially of 80 to 85 percent um, and and try to not achieve that saturation of 96 and above. I think um, I think that's something that you just gotta maybe try and train ourselves just not to 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 get too too uh, concerned over that sets of 85 that's just not responding. Uh, Prof and Vidya, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I think we can just uh, sort of uh, be in agreement that uh, one must uh, truly really accept those uh, lower parameters um, and the benefit of doing that is that you don't cause additional injury. So the more aggressive you get with your ventilation, the more damage you can do and that's going to cost you later down the line. I think, you know, that's one of the mistakes that can, can make the life difficult for the, for the critical care team is, is if we go for that sets of 99 in the emergency department and we have to put a PEEP of 20 and we have to put a you know, I think the FIO die, FIO2 has been shown uh, from the experiences all over the world that that is a good idea. So um, I think that one is one we can more comfortably go with and 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 titrate our FIO2 up and keep it high. But I think we must be careful for the other settings on the ventilator, like, like the PEEP and the tidal volumes and, and, and so on, that we don't cause additional damage that's going to make, uh, you know, the mortality of these patients one day on the ventilator is already really bad. So we have to keep ourselves, um, you know, restrain ourselves in the way we set the ventilator. I think uh, we must keep an eye also a little bit on the pre-intubation um, profile of the patient in terms of things like their respiratory rate perhaps. So if they were very, very tachypneic, we might have to be forced to just err on the side of a higher, slightly higher respiratory rate so that we don't cause the patient also to crash from a sudden severe acidosis due to maybe 
a sudden severe buildup of CO2. So that's maybe something that we'll just have to, to keep in mind as well. So if the patient was maybe breathing at 40 or 45 or something like that per minute, then we're going to have to you know, adjust our initial respiratory rate maybe higher up, maybe to the 20s or the 18s or at least to the 20s maybe. So that we don't just don't let the patient suddenly become very acidotic. So that would just be my five cents of to add to this. Excellent. Okay, I think we're getting to the end of our session. I know Dave has to go and start rounds, so I'm going to limit it. Oh, you're okay. Okay. Um, we're going to try and limit. Well, then I'll just carry on. Um, okay, so <laughs> um, I see there is a question for Dave from Dave, from Dave Clutty. Um, would you mind turning on your camera and asking your question, please? Hi Dave, um, I just want to ask you essentially, the guys from in ECs overseas have been reading quite a bit, like Scott Weingart and all of those guys, they're talking about when in the EC they actually shift patients hourly from like the right side to the left side and then to sitting and they kind of repeat that, almost like a modified proning approach. To committing these guys in the EC to like 12 to 16 hours as per the studies, etc. I'm wondering, would you recommend that? In our situation, and the only other question I had was for you is if, if you guys are using any inhaled nitric oxide in, in, in your units at all. So just to answer the, the last question, we're not we're not in using using any um, vasodilator strategies. It's quite a quite an extensive and exhaustive thing to set up in terms of the techs and, and quite expensive. So we're not doing that. Uh, at all currently uh, for our patients. Um, just with regards to your first uh, point on sort of the rotisserie kind of uh, maneuver, I think yes, there is there is some some benefit to that. Again, it's essentially just changing your ventilation perfusion perfusion matching, um, which potentially patients are able to do it and they feel better on it. Um, then I think we can do it. Whether or not it changes mortality at all, I don't know. But again, it may improve a number. Um, and I think at the moment, that's all it has shown to do. It, it improves your oxygenation. Um, again, I think if the patient's able to do it and it doesn't cause harm uh, and it may be benefit, then I think it's something which we can definitely utilize. Cool. Thanks very much. Okay, great. I see, I don't know if Conrad is still with us because um, he's no longer on um, video. Conrad, Conrad, are you with us? I can hear you and I can see you, but I don't know how to, hold on. No, that's okay. No, I just wanted to check that you're still with us because there's a question coming to you now. Um, Luke, I don't, sure, you've posted this uh, question on behalf of someone and I really don't know how to pronounce the name. So please excuse me for if I butcher your name. This comes from Polo Chopele. Um, could you turn your uh, camera on and ask your question for Conrad, please? Hello, can Hello. you hear me? We can, you can go ahead, thank you. you? Okay, uh, yeah, my question is for Dr. Conrad. It's basically related to APRV. Uh, I was just reading through and it shows that it works quite a lot if you start it early. So my question is, especially for the COVID patients that are hyperventilating, how do they go about the, putting the patient on whose respiratory rate is quite high or the APRV setting, as well as when do they start if they also do the high flow or the NIV uh, before intubating the patient? Uh, thanks for your question. It sounds like there's two components to it, and I'll try the APRV one first. I think if you've got no experience with APRV, it should be something that can get dangerous very quickly because um, sticking to the basics is your answer. And people who have been ventilating APRV early, they probably started if you've got a really severe hypoxic failure and you're failing all your usual strategies. You've tried, tried to titrate your PEEP to a blood pressure to a response. You've tried recruitment maneuvers. And the idea of APRV is basically it's a reverse ratio ventilation where you try to keep the inspiration for as high as possible and as long as possible. 
and you inflate the lungs, you give a short burst of expiration. So you're really sacrificing your ventilation and your CO2 on that method. Uh, it's a, it's a one that we reserve. So I would not say it should be recommended for all people and especially early in the strategy at the moment. I'm completely with Dave on this. If you can keep your safe parameters first, start there. Do not try to do big, massive pressure maneuvers early. And then if you've got experience with this, then you and you've got an expert who knows how to troubleshoot the troubles you might run into because you can run away with your co2 on this setting if you've got your timing wrong you can run away with pressures as well so i would reserve it for the severely refractory hypoxemic patient that you have tried all your parameters you've tried to synchronize you've paralyzed you've got your safe pressures you've considered proning you've considered moving them uh, and then once you're still stuck, I would use that as an oxygenation um, attempt and not a ventilation attempt. Uh, I hope that answers the question on that. You said something about high flow nasal cannula as well. I think they're two separate concepts that we have to consider. And I'm lucky to work in a unit where you ask for it and it comes. Um, patients in the wards who are in the respiratory ward waiting for possible ICU or not that we've got enough of that kit. Uh, like Dave said, we don't have data that there's benefit yet. It's only like seeing them improve and you get this feeling sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I've got, the, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, then if you can maybe rephrase a part that I did not answer correctly. No, I think that answers the question. Thanks, Karna. Do you have anything else that you want to add, Dave? Uh, just your mic. Yeah. So again, I was hesitant to include the HRV um, in the talk um, just because I knew people would probably get stuck on that. Um, but I, I don't. I don't think it's it's really a suitable mode of ventilation for the emergency uh, center uh, department. I think it should be reserved for when patients are in a critical care environment. Um, and I think if we do get to a point where the EC does overflow and become a type of critical care environment, maybe. Um, but again, in, in consultation with, with people that are familiar with the mode, because um, it, it requires quite a bit of intensive monitoring and, and, and assessment and evaluation when, when patients are on this mode of intervention. Okay, thanks. If I could just um, have the last word, maybe, and my question then would go out primarily to Dave and to Vidya and Prof. Um, you know, in in our clinical setting, we are compelled to develop um, strategies for scarce resource allocation, and I think we have seen uh, some discussion around splitting of ventilators. What is your feeling around uh, splitting circuits? Do you want a quick answer or a long answer? I mean, okay. I would answer. say long answer because I have all day, but uh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up after this, so maybe the shortest. My, my personal opinion on the matter, um, don't do it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's quite a... I mean, it's quite an interesting thing to talk about and, and to think about, but remember, we're not ventilating equal um, sort of balloons at the end of two type of uh, ventilatory um, strategies here. And I think if you've got somebody in a pressure or volume-based mode and somebody with compliant lungs and somebody with stiff lungs and you're splitting the vent, they're going to be, one is going to be getting all of the tidal volume and one's going to be getting none. And I think in knowing what we know about ventilating these patients, it's tricky enough having one patient on a ventilator at this current stage. I mean, our, 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 our mortality stats speak for itself. And I, I personally think um, we should be giving the patient with the, the highest chance of survival and be putting them on the ventilator as opposed to be splitting ventilators and decreasing the chances of survival for both. Yeah, I agree with you. Prof and Vidya, do you have anything else to add on this? 
Yeah. 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 I, I agree completely with Dave. I mean, it's bad enough that each patient is so different. Um, not to have the same vein settings for two of them, it's really not uh, something feasible. No, no, I, I agree. I'm, I'm actually very happy that uh, Conrad took that question about the airway pressure relief, release ventilation and that Dave handled the one about the split ventilators. But, uh, but um, I think, you know, um, hopefully we, we don't get to that point. I think that's probably something that's going to happen or again become a discussion again when we, and, and I, as I say, I really hope we don't get there, but, but if we get to the point where we've got 40 ventilated patients lying in the ED, then, then we'll, have, we'll chat about that again. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay. Thanks, guys. I just thought I would um, close off on something interesting, uh, maybe a little controversial. Uh, okay, so I think this rounds out our te teaching session for the afternoon. Thank you so very much for joining us, Dave, Conrad, Prof, and Lydia. We really appreciate your time. It's been lovely to see you all. I think it's been very beneficial and uh, really informative. Um, I just, yeah, again, similar to what we said last week, uh, we just want to preface all of this um, by saying that this is what we know today and this is what we know on this day and this hour and this minute and things evolve and change. So please, I encourage the, the group and the audience to continue to read widely and keep an open mind. Um, we are doing our best to stay as up to date and as current as possible. Um, just one last thing, Cameron, I see, has now um, posted the teaching feedback link. Thank you very much for all your very kind comments last week, but I didn't find them useful because I don't know how to improve the session. So please be more critical, continue to be gentle and not mean, but please um, provide uh, your honest opinion on how we can continue to improve uh, the session. Uh, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, please, as always, be safe, look after yourselves, uh, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Unfortunately, Ian Pritt is not going to be joining us, but we are going to look for ways to continue this in, in future. Um, Conrad Simili will not be joining us. It's just the EMCT team from next week onwards, uh, but we are working on it. So thank you very much, and have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.